So here we go. This is me. You're going to get a copy of this slide deck. So if you're unfamiliar with me, this slide gives you a number of details and some links. So I have been an entrepreneur since 1987. I've been the phone lady since 2006. And it's just about the most fun you could ask out of life, I've got to say. Um, Right now, I'm up over 400 clients and about 15,000 individuals that I have trained to communicate better, not just on the phone, but by email and internal communication as well. And I do have a book there on Amazon. I can't remember how many years ago I wrote it. The publisher's waiting for the follow-up called The Phone Book Essential Phone Communication Skills. And uh, I do have a coaching program. I love to connect with everybody on LinkedIn if you're not already connected with me there. And there is a weekly blog and there is the webinar as well. Thanks everybody for introducing yourselves. So I want to share this idea that a successful discovery call isn't an ordinary conversation. It's extraordinary. You really want that extra in there to make sure that you are going to get every detail and nuance of the challenge this individual hopes you can help them solve. The more they share with you, the more accurate your proposal is going to be. And uh, in the next webinar we have lined up, we're going to talk about that proposal. But right now, in terms of the discovery call, you do want to make it extraordinary. When our prospects are, or our clients actually say out loud what their challenge is, they can't take it back. And if you have the solution, then you're already 50% of the way there in terms of getting that business. But it's important that they say out loud what the challenge is. So I'm gonna tell you a bit of a story in terms of my own journey, I guess, with discovery calls. And it does relate to two books. Uh, the first one is this book, um, The Million Dollar Consulting. Now, I have to admit that the author of this book, uh, his writing is a bit, I'll call it on pompous, on the pompous side, or, or maybe it's very um, preachy. And so it's, it becomes a, a kind of a difficult read at times, but it's got a ton of valuable information. And one of the things that I grabbed onto immediately was this idea that I'm not an hourly person. I'm a consultant and I, I don't want to have to keep track of all my time like a um, a lawyer or something like that. This isn't about my time, it's about my skill and my intelligence and everything I bring. And so he gave me some ideas on how to make sure that my discovery call included showcasing that, that I am more than my time. I am more than our keeping track of hours and deciding on an hourly wage. And the other one was the checklist manifesto. So the idea here, this is a lovely book. It's very easy to read. Um, a tool is a great storyteller and he tells some amazing stories in this book. So it's a very easy read. And if you haven't read it, I'll give you a very quick pricey of it. It relates to the fact that because of technology, we are doing more surgeries around the world than ever before. And that, but as a result, there were more deaths or injuries in the operating room. 
And Atul Gawande was hired by the World Health Organization to figure out if they could turn this around. And in the end, what he learned was even the very best of surgical teams forgot something at the beginning of a surgery. That there were five things that they had to get right and they normally forgot one. So this impacted me tremendously because I knew I was relying a lot on my memory during the call or my scratchy notes during a discovery call and often walking away without essential information. So let's consider these two words and what they mean and how they impact how we structure a discovery conversation. So the first one is the word discovery. It actually comes to us from 14th century old French and it means to reveal or expose or uncover. In other words, when we're on a discovery call, even if we've been to this prospect's web page, even if they're an existing client and we know them well, even if they've provided us with a lot of written information about their challenge or their task ahead of time, our job on a discovery call is to reveal, expose, or uncover more. It's that more that we need to create the best proposal they're going to look at. To help us do that, we want to use our curiosity. And I have a quick story here. One of the things that I've always wanted to do is go into high schools and start teaching communication skills um, that don't involve thumbs. Because I know from the work I do that once you graduate university, these, discover these communication skills are really, really important. And I've always wanted to get them into high schools. So I had the opportunity not too long ago obviously pre-COVID, to work with three grade nine classes. And one of my exercises is about asking somebody, um, it's a listening exercise, and it's about asking open-ended questions to keep a conversation going. Now, when I do this exercise with adults, they struggle with it. They struggle with coming up with the open-ended question. They default so easily to yes, no questions. And some of them even struggle to keep the conversation going. So here I am in a room of 14 and 15 year olds, they had no problem with that. <laughs> and in thinking about that, like when I asked them, I said, so did anybody have any trouble um, coming up with open-ended questions? And they looked at me like, no, of course not. And I was so interested in that. And I wondered, do we lose our curiosity as we age? You know, if you think about a three-year-old, they're always asking open-ended questions. If you've ever spent the day with a three-year-old, they're always asking open-ended questions. So we want to go back to that place where we are eager to know and we are inquisitive. And we want to express that to the prospect or the client because it lets them know that we're really, really interested in them and that we're putting a lot of effort into finding out what they really need. Now, don't forget, put questions or comments or thoughts in chat anytime. And Eileen, you can come off mute and, uh, and do that live. So the first thing to do to go back to um, the checklist manifesto is to create your checklist for your discovery call. Don't do it 
off the top of your head. And I'm suggesting that you do it on paper. The reason is that um, listening is a big part of making a discovery call extraordinary. And numerous studies have now come out that there's a connection between the part of our brain where we listen and our holding a pen or pencil in our hand. So there's something about doing this that ignites or amplifies our ability to listen. So when we have that checklist on paper in front of us, then we will pick up the pen and we will make the notes um, handwriting. And also, as some of you probably noticed when I was clicking on my keyboard, keyboards create that background noise, whether you're on the phone or on a video call. And that can be disruptive to an extended conversation. So you really want to use that pen and paper to make these calls more powerful. Now, sometimes we think, well, I don't want to create the checklist because I want it to be spontaneous. I want to be creative. And the idea is that the checklist doesn't eliminate your adding a question or extending um, a conversation out of, about a particular item on your checklist. But it will make sure that you don't forget something important. I myself, prior to getting the checklist organized, I forgot dates by the time the call was finished, or maybe I didn't ask for them. I forgot how many people were going to attend a particular workshop or webinar, etc. Like you, you get involved in the conversation uh, just like the example of the operating room, you're going to forget something. So make sure that you have a checklist. And do embrace this constant curiosity. We don't know what we don't know about this prospect or this client. So these open-ended questions, you can have them on your checklist. But also you want to practice thinking in open-ended questions. Now there is a universal open-ended question that um, when I introduce it to people, I always hear back from them how successful it's been. And the question is simply, tell me more. So you're on the phone with a potential client, they're describing why they've reached out to you about the possibility of doing a project together. And they, they tell you something, but there's always more they could tell you. You can always extend any conversation with that phrase. Really? Tell me more about that. Wow, that's interesting. Tell me more about that and really get into all the detail, the nuance, etc., of the task. And we can create, because we're gonna have this checklist, we can work at creating outside the box questions, right? And this is that um, bit of advice from the million dollar consultant, how we want to use this discovery call to display our confidence, our belief in our skills, our value. And we can do that by asking surprising questions. I'm going to check uh, chat here for a second. Vicki, most people don't go to the grocery store without a list. So why would you do a discovery call with one? With that one? Exactly right. Exactly. That's great. Um, so one of my favorite outside the box questions, but it won't be outside the box because you're all going to take it away with you, is how will you know we've been successful? So of course, for me, a lot of my discovery calls are about training, uh, training someone or training a group of people. And 
we go through all the questions and have a great conversation. And then I pause and I say, well, how will you know this program has been successful? How will you know I've been successful? There's always a pause at their end because I've asked that question. But what they hear is my confidence in what I do. I want them to measure. I want them to be able to measure my impact on their organization. That's important to me. One of the values that I display in my proposals and on my website is return on investment. So again, this helps them hear that I am not an hourly person. I'm going to create something for you that works and we're not going to add up the hours. Eileen, go ahead with your question. Um, it's, it's more of a comment, Mary Jane. A couple of questions I found great for any kind of listening is what's important to you about? Mm -hmm. And another one is what do you want in and it, it's following on from what who what the person has been saying but it seems to me sort of get you deeper really fast yeah i love that that's great mm -hmm. and if anyone else has um you know sort of an outside the box way of phrasing questions uh yeah add it to chat that's great um i have a comment here from janet um my problem is rather than focusing on discovering more about the challenges, I jump into problem solving mode. We all do that, <laughs> which is why, again, this piece of paper that you're going to print and you're going to keep in front of you will really help you remember that you don't want to jump into problem solving mode. Um, you want to demonstrate your value so they'll hire me. And it is because you love solving problems. Absolutely. The most important thing, though, um, is to make sure that you discover what it is you don't know. So Vicky's question, surprising question, what happens if you don't find someone to do this? Great. And Linda Daly agrees, avoiding problem solving mode is a challenge. And that's, you know, I, I mean, I have that same issue. The words are right here. <laughs> and I really want to say them. And it's take, it takes practice to not say them. But if you don't have them written down, you're, you're going to keep thinking them because you don't want to forget them. And when we do that to our brains, when we are thinking about what we want to say next, but we're also trying to listen, we're only listening with 40 to 60% of our brain. So you want to take those questions. Eileen, I knew you'd raise your hand right there. Um, you want to take those questions and have them written down so you don't have to worry about trying to remember them. Eileen, tell us about it. Well, <clears throat> I, I teach problem solving. And one of the key issues is you've got to define the problem. I mean, you need to spend a lot of time figuring out what the real problem is. Most of the time, as soon as people say they've got a problem, they immediately go to solutions. And particularly with groups, that, that doesn't work. You have to clarify what the real problem is. And we do that by asking questions. And Penny Doherty's added a great, a great one there. Tell me a time when. That is a good question. And remember that this is a discovery call for you as well. We don't, no one on this call wants to take on a client that isn't ideal, for lack of a better word. Um, you don't want to work with the wrong client, the client that uh, you aren't the right solution for, or uh, the client that's going to be way too high maintenance or whatever, however we want to describe that. 
So one of mine is what individuals from your management team will be attending the training? And this is key for me because early in my career as the phone lady, I would get hired to go in and teach new skills, but no one from management was in that workshop. So no one was there to follow through and help that staff uh, embrace those new skills. Everything fell apart after that because some of what I would teach sometimes would contradict existing protocols, for example. Um, well, you know, my manager would never let me do that. And I would say, well, it will make the call better but the manager wasn't there. So I couldn't open up that conversation. And so now I ask, and if your management team isn't going to be participating in the training, you are not my client. Because I can't then guarantee return on investment. And it's so important to me. It's part of my, well, I don't want to do the work if I can't give you what you're paying for. And I can't give you what you're paying for if management isn't also attending this training. So what kind of questions can you ask and, and put on your discovery call sheet that will also allow you to, to really make sure that this client is a great client for you? That's part of the call. And then you have to make sure you get the basics. And I know this is silly, but make sure you have the right contact name, their right phone number, their email address, and their postal address. Um, Linda and that Linda Daly's on the call. She and I do a lot of work together. Um, she's pretty good at helping me uh, while well, she helps me with hundreds of things, but um, she helps me with Christmas cards and that kind of thing. So I did New Year's cards this year. And then of course realized I didn't have anybody's postal address because everybody's at home. Anyway, that's just one thought for the postal address. You know, it's good to have that. Uh, did you ask about expected start and completion dates? Did you ask about their proposed budget? Do they have a budget? Sometimes we can send the proposal in and it doesn't match their budget at all. Be nice to know a bit about what their budget is before you put the effort in. And are there other people involved in the project? And if so, what are their names? You know, and who is the main contact point? If there are other people involved, who is the main contact point and what is their absolutely correct email? Um, budget question is so important. Who are the decision makers? Absolutely. Always ask, what's your budget? Budget can be a challenging bridge to cross sometimes as well. It can. It's important to ask the question. Um, what is your budget is better than do you have a budget? Again, I really like the open-ended questions myself. Um, to let them know that you are open to talking about money. You're not afraid to talk about money. It's important to always let our prospects and clients know that we're not uncomfortable talking about money, right? Um, the main contact point, just a little story there, it only happened once, but it was such a mess, is the, the main contact approached me with an email address that they didn't use all the time. And then the rest of their correspondence was in a different email address. And I didn't notice that. And so then there was all this, <laughs> Anyway, you can just imagine the uh, communication confusion that took place by not verifying this is the address we're gonna to use to communicate. Um, 
And who are the key influencers in the organization? Absolutely. Find out who all should be at the table and who all is going to be viewing this proposal. Now, next in two weeks, I'll be doing this again, but it's going to be on the proposal itself. And um, one of the reasons for asking this question too is should the proposal be sent as a PDF or should it be sent as a PowerPoint? I certainly have had many proposals presented in a boardroom setting with five or six executives looking at a screen. So in that case, I want to be able to send it as a, a slide deck, not as a PDF. So questions, comments, we have four minutes left. So if anything's come up, even your own ideas that you'd like to share with everybody else on the call, please put them in there. Everyone that attends receives this slide deck. So um, all those links that were on the page about me, you'll, they'll be live, you can click on them. Um, you, you're gonna receive early bird notice for webinars and other special things that might come up. And um, weekly tips, stories, insights uh, from my blog. And of course you can unsubscribe at any time. And this will be, or has been recorded, and it will go up on YouTube. So I've had several people email me in the last 24 hours and it'll be there. If you go to YouTube to watch any of our videos, um, please subscribe. If I get to 100 subscribers, I can call the channel Inspire Conversation, which I'd love to be able to do. So March 11th, we're going to look at creating effective and simple proposals. And again, this is about my own journey with proposals, embracing them and enjoying doing them. I'm going to share that journey with you and take a look at some of the ways we can make it easier to do them and yet have them be very, very beautiful. Um, I'm just going to check chat here. Um, Good reminders, thanks Jane. Um, thanks Dale for, for your comments on it being a refresher. And Eleanor, thank you. Um, great stuff. As expected, I'm taking away another MJ-ism. How will you know we've been successful? Okay, great, I'm glad you're taking that away. It is, it works really well. That's good. Um, and then there's a third one in this series. Uh, oh, I didn't make a slide for that one, my fault. But the third one in the series is gonna be on follow-up. So we put a lot of effort into a discovery call. We put a lot of effort into a proposal. And then we, I was just on a call this morning with a coaching client who kept saying that somebody was ghosting her. People don't ghost us in business to business environment they get overwhelmed. So when you take it personally, that's when the whole follow-up system falls apart. So we're gonna look at how to make sure we've got a strong follow-up system in place and that we feel confident about it because we leave a lot of money on the table, a lot of good, exciting work on the table when we don't follow up correctly. So we're going to take a look at that uh, towards the end of March and you'll be getting an announcement about that. Okay, so thanks everybody for your attendance and your participation. Such great um, entries into chat and Eileen, thanks you for being brave and coming on as a panelist. Was there anything else you wanted to add? No, I think it's fantastic advice and really good reminders to us. We certainly, I know <clears throat> I'm supposed to do this. I think I was put off writing proposals when I wrote them for the government. Ah, uh, yes. The government RRS piece, and they were so, uh, they certainly weren't simple and they certainly weren't easy. And so when. No, and we, we do. We need to make them really simple and yeah. easy. 
And also, of course, you can find out more on the website about how I can help you design a sales process, a customized sales process for you specifically. I would love to do that. All right, I don't see any more questions in chat, uh, and it is 3.30. So uh, as promised, we'll wrap up, and uh, you'll be able to find this on YouTube. You'll be able to share it with anyone you think can find it of value. Um, Eleanor, I find some want a very simple proposal and others ask for a more involved one. I guess it's good to ask. Absolutely good to ask. And, you know, when we're talking about proposals, I'm going to show you one that is really easy to turn into more involved or simple without it being very complicated. And Eileen, you had another comment or question. No, sorry. I, I shouldn't have taken, oh. taken my hand down. Okay. No worries at all. Thanks, Eleanor, that's a great question. So we'll, we'll definitely take a look at that in two weeks. Okay, everybody, thanks very much.